Um, I always I always make a joke um, as we're going into the Fourth of July, you know, season, and I'm going to be in a couple of of parades. I always say the one the one sign I'm not going to see is some sign about IT procurement, right? <laughs> but I may see a sign from some of the folks in this room, you know, about about the the importance of IT of IT procurement and and efficiencies. Um, you know, my, my background, I spent nine and a half years as an undercover officer in the CIA. And I had the honor to serve, you know, shoulder to shoulder with patriots where we were chasing terrorists all over, all over the world. And I was um, in the Hindu Kush mountains in a sleeping bag that the Army told me was supposed to keep me warm up to negative 20 degrees below zero outside, and it was negative 20 degrees below zero outside, and I wasn't warm. And, and I was thinking about possibly leaving the organization in, or, in order to run for Congress. And IT procurement was not one of the issues that was on my mind when I was thinking about running. Um, but after I got here and realized how important this one particular issue is, how do you introduce the latest technology into the federal government, right? How do we ensure that we are, we are you know, uh, whatever widget the two guys or two gals in a garage are producing, how do we get that into our infrastructure? Not only to help us with defense and, and defending our digital infrastructure, but how, come, how can it not make us, how, it will also make us more efficient. In the private sector, most people, most companies, you know, that provide a service through um, their website have a customer experience officer. We don't have that in the federal government. You know, we, one of the first hearings that I had to hold when I was the chairman of the IT subcommittee on oversight and government reform was on the data act. And I asked my staff, I said, what's the data act? It's like, well, you know, it's an act to make sure that we have, you know, all of our financial information in one place that we can gain access to. And I'm like, the federal government's been allowing for how long? And we don't have all of our financial information in one place that we can get access to. It's pretty shocking that it took an actual act of Congress in order to figure out how many pencils we purchase across the entire federal government. Right? Imagine some of the data that we have in our various systems. And if that was made public to folks they can solve problems that we don't even imagine. And um, these, this is, these are the kinds of, of, of conversations we should be having. You know, it starts with having information in a machine uh, readable format, right? We're, you know, working on legislation to make sure that happens in financial services, uh, financial service regula regulators that when they regulate that this information they're obtaining is in machine readable format. We're doing that, as I said, with the Data Act. But you know, what kind of information do we have that is accessible on Department of Edu Education, on you know, use of scholarships or, or loans? What kind of information um, do we have on where uh, projects that the Army Corps of Engineers are doing? It, it, is that going to lead us to better understanding um, in our society? Probably so. And, but, it, but we don't even know the right questions to ask because we don't have access to some of that data. And I think that's what you know, the foundation of the Library of Congress is. And we're trying to help however we can to make sure that we're releasing data. Somebody asked me, you know, if I had an app, what kind of app would I want to do my job in Congress? Well, the app I would want would only be valuable. Well, I, I thought originally it would only be valuable for like 535 people. Uh, which is not a very big market, um, you know, even if it's at $2.99 right, in, in the App Store, you're not going to make a lot of money on that. But I would love to see, you know, one of the things I've learned is there's a lot of issues I'm passionate about, and there's other members of Congress that are passionate about it, but I don't know that. I don't know that because you know, I'm not spending an inordinate amount of time with many of my colleagues. I spend, I kind of understand the issues I follow on my committees, but I didn't know that, you know, Congressman or Woman X cared about a particular issue. 
If I was able to have an app that you know, took at all your votes, you know, where you voted, the types of legislation that you introduced, and gave me and said, hey, I'm working on border security, a particular a virtual wall, you know, who are the other folks in Congress that I may not know that would be part of my posse in order to get this done? Um, that's something that would, that would help me immediately. Right? Um, and I think it also helps staff. I think it also helps people that are pushing, pushing legislation to figure out who are the thought leaders or who are in a particular world. That's just one simple example that would help me uh, do my job a little bit further. And I'm glad that we have folks that are caring um, about, about this issue. One of the things, one of, one of the issues I'm most excited about is the Modernizing Government Technology Act. This is a bill that we just recently got passed in the House. I'm pretty confident we can get it done in the Senate and get signed into law. And what this does is it'll, it takes away the whole old notion of if you don't use it, you lose it, right, uh, when it comes to federal spending. I, I represent 29 counties in Texas, south and west Texas, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. In the middle of my district, there's more cows than people. Um, but in some places, I don't care where I go, if you say, if you don't use it, everybody completes, then you lose it. Right? The fact that everybody across this country understands that. Well, what MGT Act does is if a CIO, Chief Information Officer, um, transitions in the cloud, saves money, that money they save, they're going to be able to have access to it for three years to do other modernization. It's real simple. Now it gives you a motivation to save money because what people don't realize is, is networks and infrastructures are so big in the federal government that if you save money on a project, you don't have enough time within a calendar year to use that for something else. So now we give the CIOs a tool in order to continue doing modernization. Now we also create a centralized fund um, that can help spur some of these modernization efforts. But my uh, premise is that we already are spending $90 billion a year on purchasing IT goods and services in the federal government, and 75% of that money is spent on maintaining legacy systems. That's outrageous. There's already a lot of money that's being used towards, um, towards our digital infrastructure. We need to be using it a little bit in, in a better way. And that's something that giving our tools to our CIOs is, is important. One of the issues I have is when federal CIOs do not report to the agency head or the deputy agency head. This would not happen in the private sector. Our IT departments are not cost centers. They are entities that can help drive the bottom line and help provide a better service. So when there's three or four levels of management between a CIO and an agency head, we have a problem. We also have a problem with the, when the person's buying the IT goods and services is not the same person that's using the IT goods and services. So you have a lot of um, uh, the time when you should be engaging on making sure you're delivering a product that you can use is with the person that's going to use it. This is some of the stuff that we've been working in, in with Fatara. Fatara was passed a couple years ago. We shine a light on all the, the federal agencies um, to make sure that they're implementing it. And so that we start having folks with, with good digital system hygiene. So these, these are important issues because if we don't change the way the, the federal government does business, we're not going to change, change the outcomes. And so I hope that when I finally do have that IT procurement parade, um, that there's a couple of y'all that care. So I, I'm going to stop there. I don't know if the panel has questions, the crowd. We take a few questions. What do you, Absolutely. you know? Um, I, let, me, let me ask you uh, sure. one question here, if I could, Will. Sure. So as you're working on oversight or policy development, what's the most difficult public information, either in the ledger branch or the executive branch, to, uh, to use? What's the hardest sort of fact data set to uh, get your hands on? Hmm. The first thing that came to my mind on what's the hardest data set to get access to is work that has been previously been done on a particular issue. Um, you know, so many, of the, so many of the topics that we deal with, people have been dealing with it for decades. 
and what were some of those previous initiatives? And I know there's probably tools already out there to help with that, but it's not easily accessible. It's not, it's not at my fingertips. It's not in a format that is, that is um, usable for, for me. And, and that, that is, that, that's something that I wish I'd have more access to. Um, uh, something else that we need better, look, it's 2017, and the tools that I have access to in order to manage contact with constituents is terrible. They're old, it's outdated, um, it's cumbersome, it's not easy to use, and these are some of, this, this, my job is to represent the people. I had four million interactions with constituents in the last Congress, in the 114th Congress. And that is having to leverage a number of different tools in order to ensure I'm providing the value that I'm supposed to be providing. And so that is, that is something that um, you know, we should have. You know, if, if we're the NBA of, of constituent contact, um, we don't have the infrastructure we need in order to do that. What else? And one question, what about um, data visualization or analytics? What, what's, uh, what's missing that would uh, help you? So, so data visualization, um, <clears throat> the, the advances in, in 3D visualization is, is pretty phenomenal. And uh, for me, data visualization, I, I can't think of one thing that would help me immediately in, in doing my job in the 23rd District of Texas. However, um, I could see where data visualization will help the national parks. You know, we're trying to get more people to go into the parks, and we're trying to get more kids from, you know, the cities to go out to some of these locations. Why can't we gather some of that data and get it in the hands of, you know, show it at schools, take it on a little road trip, let the kids see it. And, you know, you see Santa Atlanta Canyon in Big Bend, then you go and want to go there and see it for real, all right? So this is one way, a, a tool that we can help drive um, um, attendance in, in our national parks. Um, the McDonald's Observatory is in my district. And it is um, UT, UT, the University of Texas system supports it. It's the third largest microscope, uh, microscope telescope in, in the world. And you all probably all know this. Telescopes aren't like it was back when, when I was a, a, a young, so you don't actually look in the, the eyepiece, right? It's a, it's a big sensor. And at McDonald's Observatory, they're trying to do two things. They're trying to find a thousand, excuse me, one million exoplanets. Those are planets outside of our solar system that can, pot can potentially support life. And they have a, a number of criteria which, based on these sensors, what they think is a planet that, ha that is habitable. Second thing they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out what dark energy is. You know, when most of us were in school, that term dark energy didn't come up in you know, life science class or whatever it was when we learned about the solar system. 75% of our universe is dark energy, and people don't really know what it is. You know, when I was in school, we thought the universe was contracting because it went through a period of, of expansion, and then it was contracting. But what McDonald's Observatory found in, in through a discovery of dark energy was that the, energy, the, the universe is actually accelerating in its expansion. So McDonald's Observatory is doing all of this with a sensor that they're reviewing the data on sheets of paper with their eyeballs. The lead astronomer told me he has to spend 50% of his time on coding because there's not systems out there to do this. What if we were able to give the VA and DOD healthcare and then ultimately all hospitals the ability to have a 3D image of a brain scan or a body scan, all right? What, how, would that have, how would that change um, the provision of services? So I, I, think, I think there's a, a number of ways where data visualization can improve our understanding and review of, of data. And you know, one of the things that we have to also do is we have to make sure that many of our, you know, that our, our workforce of the future is able to deal with data visualization, that they understand coding. You know, if data is, is the lingua franca 
excuse me, if data is a coin of the realm, the lingua franca is coding. And so, so we have to make sure we have more people exposed to that. And it is, it is unfortunate. Um, the, you know, in Texas alone in, in 2015, um, there was only about uh, 5,000, is it Austin? About 5,000 kids that took the AP computer science course. 5,000 in all of Texas. Um, only 24% of that were girls. And um, less than 900 were Latinos and Latinas, and only 120 African American kids took the AP Computer Science course. Those are terrible numbers. Also, in 2015, there were there were 42,000 computing jobs that went unfilled, and the the average salary of those jobs was $89,000. And so we have to start growing, folks, and that starts with introducing coding into, into uh, to kids at a younger age. One of the things I'm most proud of in my time here is that in the fall, 5,000 kids in the 23rd District of Texas are gonna be exposed to coding because we were able to get some training for 42 teachers that teach algebra to introduce coding into their algebra class. So now these kids are gonna be exposed to coding. And this, this nonprofit also has you know, a program to introduce coding in the civics class. Um, which is talking about data. How do you use data to answer questions when it comes to civics? So, you know, it's an, it's, it's an exciting area, and, you know, I could talk all day long about this, and I'm glad that there's people that are focused on um, this particular topic because we have to, one, make sure that we're capturing the data that is produced within the federal government, that's the first step. And then once we're able to capture it, then we can figure out how to take advantage of it in a way that protects privacy and in a way um, that, is, that is ultimately good for the prosperity of, of, our, of our country. What else? One more? That's it, one more. Yeah, anybody? Yes, sir. Hey, I know you. Anybody but him? No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> Yeah. And in all seriousness, it is it's wonderful that you choose to be a public servant who wants to put questions in public and in the public. Um, that's in this place when we're talking about uh, the raw materials of our democracy, mm -hmm. legislative history. Uh, but there's other kinds of raw materials too that are who owns what, who stole what, who buys what, mm -hmm. certain data, languages of data, uh, companies that exist. As you know, those are not specifically regulated. Uh, and as a result, Well, th thanks for the question, and, and look, an attack on any political entity is an attack on all the political entities, and we have to make sure that the American people can trust, our, um, uh, can trust the outcomes of our elections. Um, this is a issue that's firmly in the realm of responsibility for secretaries of states across the state. But we should be making sure that whatever capabilities that we have to defend or do reviews, that the, the states can come and ask for that. Uh, we got to make sure that some of the states that um, have old systems that we know are, are vulnerable, that we need to replace this. And, and that's, that's going to take appropriations. That's going to take money. Um, and, and I think... 
um, as we as we go into the 18 appropriation cycle that there's conversations on how do we do that for for DHS one of the things that I would love to see is I want to see when the federal government issues a contract what was the original details of that contract how much was it supposed to cost what time was it supposed to be done so that we can then and then keep track of those contracts over the life of that contract so that I can determine how many people if you're supposed to be the lowest price and at the end and what were the prices of everybody else at that time because when that con when that product is delivered I want to make sure it was delivered on time and within budget. And if it was not delivered over budget and it was more expensive than some of the other people that came in and, and offered, that is a problem. You know, when we look in 2011, we looked to, the government looked to integrate the VA and DOD um, electronic health records. Four years later, they threw up their hands, they couldn't do it, and they spent half a trillion dollars. It took about nine months for me to get the information of everybody who was involved in that project, what money was spent on that project, in order to figure out why would this, where we allow something like this to happen. So that's some of, you know, that, that is immediate concern to me because of all the money um, that is being spent, by, being spent by the federal government, and we can pr provide an oversight role of that. Man, we got time for one more, and then, then I gotta run. Yes, ma'am. Look, th th thank you for the question and, and trying to, the, the problem with when you try to collect a lot of data, you got to put it in a format that makes sense and you can make decisions from it. And, and so, um, you know, that, you have to think that through before you collect that data. And, and yes, dealing with constituents is, it should be, you know, our number one issue. This is something that I take seriously in my office to make sure that we're, we're meeting and responding efficiently to, to our constituents and making sure that we're using some of the latest technology to do that is how we do it. Now, keeping track of, of local and state issues as well, um, that, is, that is adding a, a level of complexity uh, that is outside, I think, the scope of what uh, members of Congress should be spending time on. However, it's tangential and it impacts us. So the same principles and theories we're talking about here in the federal government, we should be trying to see in the state governments and we should be trying to see at the county and, and the city level as well. And there's, there's entities like OpenGov um, that are doing this. Um, around the country in many, in many different m municipalities, and they're seeing success. They're seeing how they're uncovering a misuse of funds. They're seeing how they're uncovering people not being responsive uh, to problems with their constituents. So it is, it is a problem. That's why I hope uh, we're going we're gonna to come out, y'all gonna come out with some solutions and put some suggested bill text um, in, my, in my hopper. So thank y'all for, thank y'all for, for letting me be here today. Thank y'all uh, for being here and caring a, a, about this important issue. Talk to y'all soon.